testing one two testing yeah testing one two testing one two testing testing one two One, two, testing. Testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Good afternoon, everyone. We are starting very soon. Those seated at the back, please come in front, but make sure that you have a seat separating you from your neighbor. Those online, please bear with us. We are taking only one minute to get settled and we begin the conversation. Thank you. Make sure there is a seat between you and your neighbor. Be separated by a seat between you and your neighbor. Thank you very much. Those outside, please, we request you come in. We are starting shortly. My name is Karote Kanyinga from the University of Nairobi, Institute for Development Studies. I am the moderator for this uh, particular session. I'll be taking you through this afternoon. Please, those outside, can you come in and get settled? I request we begin right away, please. And if we can have the national anthem immediately, please. And we start up, please.
Let us bow down for a word of prayer. Lord God, our Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and love. We thank you for the grace given to us. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for health and strength. And we thank you for opportunities that you give to us. We thank you for the partnership between University of Nairobi and UNESCO. And we thank you for an opportunity that we can come together this afternoon to participate in this great conversation on the role of higher education, science, technology, and innovation in accelerating SDG, SDG implementation. We pray for the leadership of the University of Nairobi. We pray for the moderators of this event, and we pray for the discussants. And all of us as we participate, those who are present physically and those who are joining us online, we pray that this discussion will go a great way in helping us to improve in our services and in our service to mankind. We thank you for the opportunity that we can sit together and be part of this conversation. So as we begin, begin with us, and at the end of it, we'll give thanks. This is our humble prayer with thanksgiving through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be seated, please. At this time, let me take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this public lecture by Professor Hubert Sijen. Hijen, sorry, sorry for the pronunciation. It's on the role of higher education, science and technology and innovations in accelerating implementation of SDGs in the African continent. It's a seminar that is of great relevance, not only to our students' community, but also to policy practitioners and practitioners, policy makers and practitioners, wherever they are, and in particular, in this country. It is my belief and my hope that our students, graduate students in particular, will find this, this discussion of great relevance uh, to what they do and apply it in their own day activities and readings as well. Let me take this opportunity then to ask our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research, Innovation and Enterprise, uh, Professor Margaret Hutchinson to come and uh, uh, give us a word of welcome uh, on, on our own behalf and on behalf of the uh, Vice Chancellor and the University of Nairobi community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karuti Kanyinga. Uh, and uh, the distinguished guests who are here today. May I take this early opportunity to welcome every last one of you, those of you present and those online for this amazing uh, conversation around the role of higher education, science, technology and innovation in accelerating the SDG implementation. So I'll be reading the citation of Professor Hubert Legion, the UNESCO Regional Director for Eastern Africa during this public lecture. And as Professor Karuti Kanyinga has mentioned, my name is Professor Jesang Hutchinson, uh, the Associate Vice Chancellor in charge of Research, Innovation and Enterprise, and also a Professor of Horticulture at the University of Nairobi. So may I also convey the greetings and the apologies from the Vice Chancellor of the University of Nairobi, Professor Stephen Kiyama Getahi, who was not able to join us, but will be following us because he's very passionate about the discussion today. So Professor Hubert Gijzen, the UNESCO Regional Director for East Africa, Your Excellency, Dr. Christian Fellner, Ambassador of Australia, Austria, Your Excellency Ambassador Brower Martin, the Ambassador of the Netherlands, Your Excellency Ambassador Pirka Tapiola, Ambassador of Finland, Your Excellencies High Commissioners and Ambassadors of Eritrea, Ambassador of Belgium, Ambassador of Sweden, and all the ambassadors present, both physically and also online, 
members of the academic community, distinguished discussants, Professor Michael Chege and Dr. Emmanuel um, Manyasa, who is here with us, all the invited guests, online audience, members of the Fourth Estate, ladies and gentlemen. In 2013, the African Union adopted what we have now come to call the Agenda 2063 under the title, The Africa We Want, that captured and presented a vision for the socioeconomic transformation of the continent over the next 50 years. Two years later, the member states of the United Nations unanimously adopted the Agenda 2030, transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, both agendas pre present a historic plan to wipe out poverty, to fight inequality, and to transit towards a more sustainable development path globally. The sustainable development challenges are indeed complex and they require collective action and responsibility from all the citizens of the world. These agendas call for transformational change in the many sectors that anchor and are central to our developmental agendas, such as health, energy, climate change, food, food and nutritional security, mobility, and transportation, ICT, water, sustainable cities, among many others that are relevant to the different countries which are represented. The issue is that these transformations need and must be made almost simultaneously. And this then adds further to the complexities in the achievement of sustainable development goals that are set globally. So in order to manage these complexities, a long-term vision, a clear strategy that puts education and science, technology and innovation at its core is required. So to achieve this, a new mindset, a wave of knowledge, creativity, innovation must be unleashed with such energy as never seen before. This then underpins a key role for universities and for the science, technology, and innovation. This calls for a strong science to inform policy and also for strong policies for science support. As part of the strategy for Africa's transformation, we must avoid re repeating mistakes of the past that we are done elsewhere. In other words, we don't just simply copy the unsustainable sea-based economic model of developed nations. So while the world is moving into the fourth industrial revolution, much of Africa is yet to fully reap full benefits even from the second or the third revolution. So this calls for a highly innovative strategy to leapfrog the continent through a green transition and by generating benefits from the merging of the implementation of the second, the third, and the fourth industrial revolution simultaneously. That is a big task. As such, Africa could save significantly on time and on resources by avoiding immensely expensive mistakes made by others in rolling out previous industrial revolutions in their continents. So ladies and gentlemen, this public lecture will outline the main challenges to be addressed and to identify the roles to be played by universities and by the science, technology, and innovation ecosystem to catalyze this global transition towards a world and an Africa where people live in harmony between themselves and also with nature or the environment. Allow me therefore to briefly introduce our speaker for today, Professor Hubert Gitsen. Professor Gitsen from the Netherlands holds a PhD in biotechnology 
and has established a career of over 38 years in both the academia and also in the international cooperation for sustainable development space. Professor Gidsen is a full professor of environmental bi bi biotechnology at IHE Delft Institute for Water Education since 1995 and also with Wagengen University in the Netherlands. He is also a, vi a visiting professor in many other institutions. He has published over 400 articles and books and presented numerous keynotes in the fields of water management, microbiology, environmental sciences, biotechnology, sani and sanitary and environmental engineering, indeed a mouthful. Professor Gitson has held a wide range of senior positions as full professor and also chair of various universities, as a diplomat, as a team leader, as a regional representative, and currently serving as the UNESCO regional director and also representative. Professor Hubert also covered to topics and currently still does on international cooperation sustainable development, the MDGs, which were then now the SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals, Big Data, and Climate Change. He served in various international advisory functions and on boards of prestigious institutes and programs. Time does not allow me to name all of them. Now, throughout his career, Professor Gitson has lived and worked in various countries in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, and in Europe. Professor Hubert Gitson joined the UN in 2006 as the director of UNESCO, Regional Science Bureau for Asia and the Pacific, based in Jakarta, Indonesia. In 2015, he was appointed as the regional director of the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa in Harare, Zimbabwe. And from 20, July 2021, he was called to serve as the UNESCO regional, uh, at the regional, UNESCO regional Office for Eastern Africa in Nairobi and as the UNESCO rep to Kenya, Comoros, Djibouti, Eritrea, Madagascar, Mauritius, Rwanda, Seychelles, Somalia, and Uganda. He is, in addition, still the UNESCO rep to the SADC and also COMESA, and serves as the UN Regional Director's team leader and is a member of the UN Regional Coordination Platform for Africa. May I add that with all what I have said, with your permission, Professor Gitson, he sleeps only three hours and 20 minutes to be exact. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly join me in welcoming this academic and development giant in the name of Professor Hubert Gitson. Welcome, Professor, to address us. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, for the kind words. I can see uh, you have probably Googled me, and I can confirm that most of it was actually true, uh, because when you Google, you always have to be careful. Is it fact or is it fake? Uh, so thank you very much uh, also to the Vice Chancellor for hosting this public lecture. It's a pleasure to talk to academia, to students, and share some thoughts on the difficult times we're in. And I'm not just uh, referring to COVID. Uh, I'm referring to the complex challenges that we're faced with uh, in terms of sustainable development and the agendas that we have set and committed to. Um, so I would like to touch on that. Maybe before doing so, um, uh, just, uh, I would like to say a few words maybe about the United Nations and about UNESCO so that you know where, where do we come from. Um, so let me see and also see if this mic works because then this mic works as well so I can 
move from the podium. So the UN and UNESCO, just a few words so that you know, I mean, everyone has heard about the UN, but uh, this is the building in New York. That is maybe the image that you have, or maybe you have the image of the big hall of the, um, of the General Assembly. You see the picture in the middle where the president of Kenya is addressing the General Assembly, I believe last year. Uh, on the picture here on the right, you see the building in New York. On the left, you see UNESCO, which is uh, headquartered in Paris. Um, <clears throat> so the UN was actually invented in the year 1945. And you will remember that was in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And in that sense, it was a successor of the so-called League of Nations, which was established in the immediate aftermath of World War I. And, and in both occasions, with both initiatives, I think world leaders came together in the realization uh, and, and saying that uh, this happened, but never again. Um, and when we saw World War II, that voice became louder and the commitment was there to turn the League of Nations into the United Nations, uh, which was then born when uh, uh, the, limit, uh, the, the minimum number of member states had ratified the charter, and that date was 24th of October. So that's a few days from now, and every year, 24th of October, we celebrate UN Day. And what does the UN do? Well, basically, in six main areas, uh, it, it uh, facilitates cooperation because it's a member states based organization and what it does is facilitate cooperation between member states in economic development, in social progress. What happened with the projection here? Um, in international law, uh, the International Court of Justice for instance, in uh, international security, um, you know about the peacekeeping, and that's always uh, in, in the news, the peacekeepers. Uh, human rights and the achievement, of course, of world peace, and this is the overarching objective of the United Nations. And this is reflected in the structure of the UN. You see here a picture of the six main uh, organs of the UN, so the General Assembly, the decision-making platform, where all the world leaders come together, the Security Council, the Secretariat, uh, the Economic and uh, Social Council, um, and we have the International Court of Justice. So that's, uh, in brief, the UN, and uh, as you know, the UN development system is composed of many different agencies. I represent UNESCO, that's merely one of so many. Uh, and you see here a list, I've just taken a few to illustrate that they were not all established on the same day. Uh, UNESCO was uh, formally established in November 1945, so immediately after the establishment of the UN. Um, but other organizations came a bit later, and you see here the list, uh, the FAO in December 46, uh, the uh, let me take another example, UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, only established in 86, 1986. The World Tourism Organization in uh, 2004, and uh, the younger ones are UN Women in 2010, and uh, IOM in 2017. <clears throat> um, the public image of the UN is a big question mark, and, and Many will say the acronym UN, what does it stand for? And some may say useless nations. Uh, others may say U UN unable. Uh, and many think of the UN as being the Security Council and then you get these kind of qualifications. And indeed, uh, that image is there and we're aware of it. But let's look at also at from the other side. This is a collection of all the member states of the world. So in fact, uh, you could say UN, it is also you and me. It is all of us together. And if there is uh, a need to blame, 
and, and say it's not efficient, it's not cost effective, uh, you can't reach a decision in the Security Council. Well, then let's look at ourselves, because we are the UN. You are the UN. And let's together improve it in that sense. So UNESCO, the acronym, we like acro acronyms in the UN. Uh, we have acronyms for everything. If you sit, when I joined the UN quite late in my career, and I said in the first meetings of regional directors, I thought, I asked my neighbor, what language is this? I thought it was a foreign uh, language I hadn't heard of, acronyms. UNESCO stands for Education, Science, Culture, and Communication. Um, I always say we have the nicest mandate of the whole UN, uh, but I guess all uh, the other heads of agencies will say the same. UNESCO was established in 45, as I said. Now, I want to share with you here the first sentence of our constitution. And again, remember when UNESCO was established, the immediate aftermath of World War II. And it says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. What a powerful sentence. What a wisdom of the founding fathers of UNESCO in those days. And then they go on and they say, and UNESCO will do this and exactly this uh, by making operational our mandates in education, in science cooperation, in culture and appreciation of heritage and cultural diversity and in communication and information. So the curtain now opens to the presentation. So with that brief introduction on the UN, let's now come to the topic of today. It is on the SDGs, Agenda 2030, but also indeed on the vision uh, of the African Union, which is a much more longer term vision uh, towards the year 2063, uh, the vision. Uh, it's called Agenda 2063. I keep on uh, uh, referring to it as a very solid and sound vision. Um, and if, if you vision something for the future based on problems of today and the challenges of today, what you then need is to really zoom out to see the big picture. Uh, so I could also have given as a title for this lecture, the big picture. Um, and, and really we don't do that enough. We, we are always zoomed in. We're talking about a specific issue on a specific day in a specific meeting. Uh, and what I would like to try and do in the coming uh, 40 minutes is to zoom out a bit and see the big picture. So I will, and you see the elephant here, uh, blaming the, 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 what is it, a rabbit, uh, that he doesn't see the big picture. Um, the big picture on what, what are now the real big issues and problems that we're faced with? Uh, and what are possible solutions to those? And what role does science, technology, and innovation play? And what has, what role has science and innovation played in the past. So we will look at that. So to start with that big picture, we must realize, so if you're all zoomed out and you would be in outer space and look at this planet, what would you see? You would see that this is a planet in trouble and that this is a, a planet which is alarmingly out of balance. So the issue is imbalance. And basically that imbalance has two dimensions. First the imbalance between people and planet Earth, and that is usually what we talk about when we say sustainable development, the environment. And then the second, maybe even more important imbalance, is that between people, the inequalities, the lack of access. Let me start with the first, the inequalities, the imbalance between people. Look at this picture. This is taken in Sao Paulo in Brazil. You see the wall, the fence in the middle? And it runs between the rich apartment complex inhabitants on the right 
and on the left, the slum areas, and then the figures. If you take the 50% of the poorest people on this planet, so 50% of people who earn less, they own only 1% of global wealth. Now, if you take the 1% top earners of this planet, they own 50% of global wealth. And women earn only 10% of global income. So that is the world we live in. These inequalities between people also manifest themselves in areas of access to health services, food. Um, we see that modern medicine has uh, answers to most diseases, even uh, COVID. Within less than a year, we have a vaccine. Uh, and yet we see uh, that many millions and millions of people die from curable disease. We also see the same with food. Globally, we produce much more food than we could ever consume together. And yet, there is over 800 million people that go hungry every day. So these are some of the inequalities. And they're also captured in an index. It's called the Gini Index. Many of you may have heard about it. But here, the Gini Index is projected on the world map. And where I put the circle, uh, so the, the, the more darker the color, the darker the red is, the bigger the inequalities. And where do we see the biggest inequalities in the world? It's, it's here in Africa. It's in the southern part of Africa. Let me put this away. And these inequalities create feelings of injustice and they are triggers for violence, for wars and for intolerance. And that's the situation that we are faced with. Now, let me then come to the imbalance between people and planet and, and we know it and soon we have the COP, uh, the COP coming up in Glasgow, uh, and I hope that many of you will join in the discussions. And the first thing we think about the planet, climate change. And you see here some graphs of carbon dioxide uh, and of population. Uh, we know it is also deforestation. We need more and more land to grow our food for a growing population. There is therefore a huge loss and an ever increasing speed of loss of biodiversity, which is extremely worrisome. Um, we see massive pollution of uh, air, soil, and water. And then the oceans. We forget about the oceans. Let's remind ourselves, two-thirds of this planet is covered by oceans. Only one-third is landmass. And we forget about the oceans. <coughs> the oceans are really under threat <coughs> due to overfishing, pollution, acidification, uh, sea level rise. We see so many issues around the oceans. And then, as a last, let me point that fresh water, which is uh, probably one of the biggest sustainable development challenges we are faced with on this planet. Uh, you see here some graphs of the, de of the use of the increase in the use of fresh water in three sectors, in agriculture, domestic use, and industry. And together, we consume today some 4,000 cubic kilometers. What a difficult unit to imagine. Cubic kilometers of fresh water uh, per year. And the increase of that is, is huge. What you also see is in the left graph for agriculture that agriculture consumes out of the total 70 percent. So 70% so of all the fresh water that we use goes to our food production systems. And now I ask the question when we have still 800 million people hungry and we have another 2 billion people to join us on this planet in the coming decades, how are we gonna produce enough food? when we already are in trouble with water, and the evidence was there just uh, two years ago, 
Cape Town, the water crisis, there was big news everywhere, you must have heard about it, but I'm sure you can go to places in Kenya and see the same. Um, here in Kenya, again, we're uh, uh, heading to is a, a crisis on water, uh, also this coming season. So that is basically the big picture of challenges and problems along these two categories, uh, the imbalance between people and planet, the imbalance between people. And that is exactly what this agenda intends to do. This complex agenda after long negotiations, uh, 17 sustainable development goals. Yeah, and then some of you, including myself, when this was launched, would say, yeah, but I can't even remember 17 goals. It's, 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 it's very difficult. Um, Yes, if you would look at each of the uh, SDGs individually, it is very difficult to comprehend, especially if you realize, and that's the next picture, that behind each of these goals, there are targets, many targets, and you get lost, and you wonder, where, where do we start? There was 169 targets, and then even uh, in, in a research group in a university, you may be focusing on one sub-sub aspect of one particular target out of the 160 of the 17 goals. So where to start? Is it, is it uh, target uh, 8.3? Is it 3.2? Um, how are they interconnected? And that's the point. We need to look at the agenda differently. And if you zoom out, you can see that. So if you put all the big nodes here these are individual SDGs. And you start now drawing lines between, and the smaller nodes are the targets, and you start connecting those, and you see where are the connections. And you see, this is an integrated agenda. You can't say, I take uh, SDG 4, which is education, target 7, which has something on global citizenship education, um, and take it uh, forward alone. So you have to look at this in its totality. And now even more tricky, let's imagine, and I pick one target, um, under six. Goal six is what? Is water. And there is a, a water and sanitation goal. If I advance on that target and I give more people drinking water, what happens next? that people are healthier, so that has a positive effect on SDG 3, correct? Less disease. But what effect does it have on the environmental goals? Because this creates more wastewater, which pollutes more water resource, and downstreams may create more disease. So that is what I mean with these complexities. And so therefore, if you imagine the SDGs like this, and all the targets in a three-dimensional space, and you would push one target forward, you would see that all the 168 other targets start moving as well, just because of your action on one target. And they move not only forward, they move also sideways, and possibly some will move backwards, as I just illustrated. So that makes this agenda terribly complex. And therefore, to understand it, we need to zoom out again and see the big picture. And I illustrate that via a photo. This is the big picture, is it? What do we see? It's a, it's a gun. It's a, it's a weapon. It intends to kill something. I don't know what. Uh, it, it's... it's it's a negative symbol, correct? Um, and that happens when you're zoomed in. Because actually, if you zoom out, you see the real picture. The big picture is the real picture. It is a monument. And it is a monument for peace. So it is a weapon with a knot in it. It was uh, produced by a Swedish artist, I believe in 1983, donated to the UN, this uh, building in the back is the UN building in New York. So next time you visit New York, go and make your own picture. 
And if you do that, if you zoom out from the SDGs, you see actually the picture is more simple. In fact, the Agenda 2030 and its 17 goals are basically three main pillars. It is an agenda to its sustainable development and a green economy. And that is what was discussed in Rio Plus 20. It is the unfinished business of the MDGs and the eradication of poverty. And the third, it is about living in peace. And that is, in a few words, what Agenda 2030 is about. Now let me come to the second question. So if we have zoomed out and we understand better what these challenges are, how can now science, technology, and innovation help to address some of these key challenges? And how can it help leapfrog sustainable development in Africa? Now, in order to do that, you need to first look back and ask the question, what has been the role of science, technology, and innovation in the past? Um, and then in the present, today, and then look into the future. And we can learn a lot about that because mistakes were made, first of all, by seeing that, and I have pictured here the four industrial revolutions, we're now in the fourth, so, so the, the first was basically about energy, steam, uh, the second about electricity, the third about ICTs, and the fourth is taking this further by connectivity between high techs and artificial intelligence. So this has happened, but we have also seen that continents and countries have not moved at the same, at the same speed. Much of Africa has not even benefited from the second industrial revolution. In, in sub-Saharan Africa, when the COVID crisis hit, the world went digital, but in sub-Saharan Africa, we were left behind. 50% of the schools are not on the grid, let even ICTs, no energy. And the third uh, revolution, much of Africa hasn't benefited from it. So if you look at the past, we see the, the first industrial revolution, the trigger was the steam, uh, uh, steam engine, uh, 1686, if you remember. Uh, we saw in the 19th century also uh, an important development, uh, uh, the medical revolution uh, triggered by the discovery of penicillin, that you have antibiotics. Um, today we see that this has built some of the biggest industries in the world, the Pfizer's and so on, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, the Green Revolution, as we used to call it, in the 60s, in the, it started in the 50s, 60s, 70s of the last century, which was badly needed because the food production systems in those days would not be able to feed the projected population. So something was needed, fertilizer came up, the use of pesticides, uh, later the, the crop improvement methods to get higher yields. Uh, but of course, with this, we saw also a lot of pollution uh, by fertilizer, eutrophication of water bodies, water hyacinth blooms, uh, pesticides that go into water systems, and there is now proof that there is a link to certain types of cancer. So what I'm pointing at is that previous STI applications may have been very clever solutions at that point of time, uh, but over longer times actually cause problems. And that, that's a message we need to understand. And I tend to say to my students that the real big problems of today are the result of the solutions of yesterday. And if you think of it, it's probably true for many areas. And here you see the transportation revolution. How fast did we go from the first bicycle in the year 1790 to what we have today with planes? The first tourism in outer space happened just a week or two ago. Imagine. Uh, at present, it's clear, we are in an ICT revolution. Um, you see on the left uh, an old computer room 
in the University of Virginia in the early 60s. These were actually three rooms interconnected, the space of the podium full of equipment, and they had a capacity of a fraction of what I carry now in, in our pockets, it's a cell phone. And now we have these high-speed laptops. And then the question uh, is, what about the future? Uh, what is the SDI for the future? And my answer is, I don't know. Uh, would it be a biotech revolution? Biotechnology has held a long time promise, has done a lot of good things already. But would that now come up? Nanotechnology, high speed computing with big data, uh, combinations of the above with artificial intelligence, who knows? The future is undecided, and I'm sure all of these will play a role. But what I do know is what we need. We need an SDI revolution focused on sustainable development. And that is because if we look back and take note of what we, how we mobilized SDI in the past for development in those days, well, it has brought us, for instance, the carbon-based economy. And now we know that was the wrong track. We need to go back, take another track. Uh, the example of the green revolution with pesticides, wrong track, let's go back. Uh, the consumption of water, so much water to produce food. Imagine, how much water does it take to produce one kilogram of beef? Well, the answer is about 15 cubic meters of water. To grow all these hectares of grassland to feed one cow, to have a, a steak in the evening for nine billion people in the year 2050, is that feasible? Is that sustainable? Is that where we are going? So the past interventions of science and technology maybe were useful at that point of time, but they were not clever enough to be sustainable. And that is the message uh, because of two reasons. First. We left many, many people behind who have not benefited from these developments. <clears throat> and the benefits came at huge environmental costs. And now we are faced with this and need to uh, address this. And also to point that uh, the vision, the agenda 2063, there is a very strong recognition. And I gave some quotes from the document a strong recognition of the role of science, technology, and innovation. So please look at that document, and that recognition is there. Now let me uh, address the question universities, uh, which are the powerhouses for the production of science uh, R&D capacity in any country. Uh, universities have in Africa have challenges. They have their own challenges. And we know them. Uh, they are related to quantity. Uh, we have a growing portion of youth in the continent. Um, and do we have access for all of them to university? Do we have that capacity? We don't. Um, so the number of universities, the number of researchers, but also think of the output, the number of publications and patents the, the percent of women in higher education, the quality challenges. Just one illustration. Uh, I looked at the top 200 of universities, the top 200 ranking. Uh, there's only two universities from Africa, and both are located in South Africa, in one country. It's the UCT and uh, Wits University. The lack of cooperation, harmonization of programs between countries, different standards, different uh, uh, processes of degree recognition. How can you have a common market if you, don't, if you can't even recognize the degree of your neighboring countries, the graduates of students? So that is a challenge. Uh, why is that still problematic? 
well, do, do we trust the quality of a university somewhere else? Yeah, I, I think so. When it's UCT or WITS, we will, we will do. But do we trust the quality of all the universities? So there are issues with quality assurance and quality assurance mechanisms in universities. So I would say that turn that into an opportunity. We have the Addis Convention. Look at it as an opportunity to harmonize to use also the power of connectivity and cooperation to come together and develop between universities in a region joint degrees, joint programs, or at least where universities offer certain modules and together you have a high quality MSc and PhD program and also high quality research programs. So imagine what happens if you put the best brains together to do that. Now your quality goes up. <coughs> we see challenges in capacity in uh, research in R&D. Here are some statistics. This is from the UNESCO Global Science Report. <coughs> and uh, you see that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have less than 100 uh, researchers per million. Uh, the, uh, in higher income countries, we're talking about 3,800. Uh, the world average is 1,000. So we are only at 10% here of the global average. In Kenya, it's doing slightly better, uh, 320 almost. <clears throat> and then uh, the issue of gender, gender parity. We're doing quite well. If you look here at the different levels of uh, uh, university training, uh, at bachelor's level and master's level, women are represented by 53%. That's great. PhD, it goes down to 43. But then when they graduate and you look in the workforce and the researchers, it goes further down. It's only 28. So we lose them. We call this the leaking pipe. And we need to have it, we, we need to call a plumber, correct? And then about quality. Let, let's remind ourselves, quality has a price. Quality doesn't come cheap. What now I ask, what, what is the budget of the university here? What percent of the, the GDP in Kenya is allocated for R&D? The OECD recommends 3% of, of the GDP of any nation to go in R&D. In, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're probably looking at 0.4%. And mind you, that is GDP, so of a much lower GDP already. So in real hard money, it's, it's much, much lower. Uh, what is the pay of our academics? How do we pay them? How do we reward them? <clears throat> and that, yes, is related to quality. The top universities in the world, look what kind of salaries they offer. What, what does a vice chancellor earn in a top university? Uh, and, and a distinguished professor in a certain field. Uh, the number of fellowships available, uh, very limiting. Uh, the top facilities in a country. So all of this means investment. And uh, yeah, just uh, the, the illustrations are clear. When we buy a car, we know it. This one uh, costs a little bit more on the right, and this one indeed is half price. Uh, but there are opportunities. So this harmonization of program will allow better cooperation between universities. A strong quality assurance systems that are this convention. Uh, joint collaborative programs that I talked about. Uh, mobilize the power of connectivity. And that's the way to go. But also think about STEM education, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. <clears throat> and especially uh, on girls. Um, and we have programs focusing on girls as UNESCO STEM education, and we do also uh, boot camps. Uh, this was one in last year in Victoria Falls, where we bring young people together <clears throat> to program robots and have fun and see how nice and interesting science and technology is. We have another program uh, on TVET, because TVET is usually seen as something for those who can't really learn. Well, that's wrong. 
and TVET programs are very important. If we want to make that green transformation in Africa, we need at the technical level the skills to do that. Who is going to install those solar panels? Who is going to repair your batteries? Uh, who, who has the knowledge of an electrically driven car? Uh, so, so we need TVET. And what we see in TVET is a very low percent of women. So in the project we were doing in the program, we were stimulating women to come in and make it more attractive. And we saw a challenge was that the men would look at them, the young boys, like, you can't do that. Uh, become a car mechanic. So we, we worked with a young lady in Malawi, a singer, quite famous already in Malawi. And we had produced a song. And she sings the song. And the lyrics, uh, you can't follow it. It's Chichewa. But the song Here really, in Jiwanka, the song says basically that we as women, we can do this, we can manage this, we, we can learn this and practice this too and we can have a job in this and the, the pictures show it and the singer really made this song. So let's listen for a few seconds to the song. Chifuwa shake po muni ya dira kuti nyadu Jima mu chama ingwazi Ingwazi ya shikazi Atundi ne wangazi Siminga gwira nchito zina ahi Potundi ne wangazi Ine banga nipa nyumba basi Nito kala jili jose ninga funelelo Nito gwira nchito yomwe ninga funelelo I am a soldier, plumber, even a pilot too. Even mechanics, even carpentry too. So before you all start dancing, let me continue. Uh, but that was very powerful. This song hit the charts in Malawi, became number one, stayed there for three months. The lady became so famous she couldn't go out on the street anymore. And also we submitted this song, and this was an EU-funded project. And we submitted it every year the EU has, from all their projects globally, a competition of the best communication award, and this song won the award. So I would like to refer to the role of science and technology again and emphasize how important it can be. And what we saw in the 80s, 90s was the Asian Tigers. Everyone talked about it. You will remember that. And you can see what that did. In, 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 these, in this period, Asian countries, some of them, invested heavily in education, science, and technology. And the result was this. You see the blue line in the graph? That is the, the GDP of Ghana, the per capita income in Ghana. You see the red line? That is uh, the Republic of Korea. And the Republic of Korea, if you see in the 60s, was below Ghana. And see where they are now. And they are a major donor now, an ODA partner. So this was possible because they invested in science, technology, and R&D, and education. And therefore, I think it's high time that we unleash the African lions. With, they are much more strong than tigers, of course. And if we focus in Africa on R&D, education, and on universities and invest in them, we will make the same progress. So the last part of the presentation, I will focus and zoom out a bit on what are now the real problems we are faced with in this balance between people um, and the balance between people and planet. And, and the four main sectors of concern are really energy, water, and food. And of course, social, the inequalities and the, and the poverty. And what we therefore need is to look at that more strategically. If we address these four key issues, we would have addressed basically most of the SDGs. Because if you solve these, you have to a large extent solved climate change, biodiversity loss, the, the rebalancing of elemental cycles of carbon, of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, you have stopped the ocean acidification. You have the sustainable water management. 
uh, and you have addressed uh, the issue of poverty and inequalities. So, so these are the ones. And why is that so? Uh, and what do we need? What we need is new energy, new water, new food, and we need a new mindset and social transformation. So that requires a vision, a vision for a long-term, a sustainable world in which, let's say, mid of the century, 2050, uh, nine billion people can live a decent quality of life within the planet's limited resources. And that is something that's not easy. But think of it. If, if you think about addressing these big challenges, what a world this could be. How could it look like if we had addressed the issues of living in balance with the planet, with water, with biodiversity? How would it look like if we have addressed the issues of inequalities and thereby create the conditions of living more peacefully together. So that's the picture we must imagine. And I'm sure that was what John Lennon imagined when he composed this song. So let's look at that picture. And I show a few slides to help you image it. Uh, wh what about uh, a situation where poverty is a syndrome of the past? We don't have poverty anymore. And people live healthy lives and well-being for everyone. A world where we live as peaceful societies next to each other, where we appreciate diversity. It is unity in diversity. That is the new slogan. Uh, a world where we also come to grips with our imbalance with the planet. Uh, not just green buildings, not just green cities and eco-cities, but a green economy and also a green mindset. Um, so also for Africa, let's make this happen. Uh, the greener cities in Africa, this is a picture from FAO. <clears throat> but also think about transport, and it won't take long and we have electric mobility. So how will it look like? How will it uh, be? Uh, less pollution in the cities, less noise, uh, and what about these three main drivers of sustainability? Uh, it's about energy, it's about water, and it's about food and their interrelationship. And we need to look at that. Now, for energy for Africa, we, we probably know the way to go. We know what new energy means. Is it uh, solar? Is it wind? Is it geothermal? Um, I, I don't know. It could be biofuels. I don't know which one will win the competition, but uh, we will see probably two, three survive, and the band, depending on location, you have different priorities. Um, and when you have energy, also in the rural areas, suddenly you can use ICT. So think about the power of that for local development. And then people would ask, what is new water? Well, again, here you need to imagine a bit. Look at how we are treating water Today, water is probably the most poorly managed natural resource on this planet. And we need to manage it well. Um, and we have to think about cities where we live with water, because flooding will be part of us. And if you have then planned for lakes inside the city, then the water knows where to go, and you don't get wet feet. So these water bodies in cities can then also cater for the shortages which you have in the dry season. So storage, recharge, the bottom of these lakes will be fully engineered to have efficient recharge to groundwater. That's the future. And this is how we live already in Holland. Uh, the right hand side is, a, is a, an animation. The left hand side is a casco house on the water, it floats. Uh, and you can finish it in your own colors, you can have it with a garage and a ramp to the, to the road. That's the future, but it is already there. And, and think about the good thing. I mean, I, I have to move a lot when I move to a new city and a new country for a new job. What you do need to do is just hire a boat. You don't need to pack and unpack. Isn't it fantastic? <clears throat> Then our waste, um, and again looking at water, uh, 
the, the most disgraceful use of water, and let me share that example with you, is the following. We treat fresh water up to the highest possible quality called drinking water, zero coliform, crystal clear, you can drink it, to flush our toilet. And we do it every day. Now, that, that's a disgrace. Uh, I call the flush toilet uh, both an environmental and a public health disaster. Because what it does is then it turns all that water into wastewater, which flushes out into the nearest stream. We don't have money to treat that water, so it contaminates the whole water body and people downstream get sick. Uh, what we, how does the future look like? Now imagine this, so all the houses will be connected to a vacuum system. The toilets will separate urine from fecal matter Fecal matter goes to centralized or decentralized underground, fully automated composting systems where this, the first generation produces hydrogen gas, uh, sorry, methane gas, the second generation in 15 years can make hydrogen gas out of this. And then multiple use of, of space, we're in cities, so on the top you have a park, or in this case, uh, a, a football court. That's the future. And then people say, yeah, but vacuum, very expensive. But uh, you can calculate the amount of energy you get from this is much more than you need to run the vacuum system. And you can supply that energy back to the same household for air conditioning or heating. And now the urine, and this is a hypersonic toilet. It separates urine, and urine is a chemical waste because we take so many of these pharmaceutical products. Think about the percent of young women taking birth control pills, uh, which is uh, an effective method, so I'm not disqualifying that, but these are steroid compounds, the most rigid chemical structures that cannot easily be managed in the environment. And what to do with it? And, and what about all these antibiotics and other products that we, that we take? They go out via the urine. So the city of the future has a collection of urine centrally and outside of the city there is a pharmaceutical company recovering all of this and putting it back in nicely in tablets for you. So that could be done. It's technology. Now the last one, what is new food? And here again let me emphasize what is the current impact of our food production systems when we talk sustainability uh, it, is, it is consuming 70% of fresh water, 80% of deforestation. Uh, it, is, it is a massive driver for biodiversity loss. It almost uh, accounts for 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is the largest non-point source pollution, especially of nasty chemicals like pesticides, <clears throat> and it generates a host of ethical questions, in particular, the bio-industry. So is this sustainable? And then, what is new food? Well, we, we have different ways of producing food. Food is biomass with the right nutritious components. We need protein, we need nutrients. You could do that by growing algae, for instance. And just calculating, you would need to feed the world population three and a half times the size of Portugal. Now, that's not too much. And then you don't need land, you can grow algae in the ocean. So that could be it. And then processing this algal biomass into food products, that's technology. We can solve that. Another example is here. We can grow tissue cells. We can take the cell, the stem cell from a cow and grow beef cells. And we do that in research. I used to do that as a young student in petri dishes. You see that on the left. But what if you scale that up to industrial scale and you grow beef and you grow chicken and you grow fish? And some will say, yes, yeah, sir, but that is science fiction. Is it science fiction or science? Next slide. This was the first hamburger produced by tissue culture in the year 2013. 
The whole project costed $330,000. I agree, that's an expensive hamburger. The bad news is it was not very tasty. Uh, uh, the reason is that with real meat, you have fatty tissue that gives you the flavor and the taste. But again, that is technology that will follow. That was the 2013. Today, we have several startups. Uh, the first hamburger was produced by the university in Maastricht in the south of the Netherlands. They have created a startup called Moza Meat. They have promised to bring this commercially into the supermarket in the, within five years' time. Uh, we have Memphis Meat in the US. Uh, you see the timelines here. This is coming, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak. And therefore, I will end by saying welcome to the future. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's clap again and welcome to the future. I think that concept of welcome to the future is a very good way of making a good summary of what Professor Hubert has done, and in particular trying to look at what is going to be the role of higher education in what we are doing. Of course, there are quite a number of questions to ask with regard to higher education in Africa and whether we are actually prepared for that particular future that he's welcoming us to. Is it possible given the challenges that the African continent face? the kind of skills that we require to face that future, the kind of skills that we require for the fourth revolution that he has talked about in a very um, convincing manner. The role of future science and technology, what is it going to be and what, is, what, what role shall we be playing there? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome me now. I mean, well, let's welcome uh, uh, the, the discussants. Professor Michael Chege, who is one of our own, I'm calling him one of our own because Professor Michael Chege has mentored many of us. I was been mentored by Professor Michael Chege myself. I'm long, many years, I don't want to say my age, of course. My colleague, Iguine Metula, is seated down here. She was also a student of uh, Pro Professor Michael Chege. Um, Professor Michael Chege uh, teaches uh, political economy. Uh, he's been a mentor, a researcher. Um, here at this university, then he's been at uh, Indiana University where we, many of us used to visit him, used to get us scholarships those days, talk about higher education. We can count many of us in social sciences uh, who are passed through the hands of Professor Michael Chege uh, in this university and several other universities in, in Kenya here. Uh, Professor Michael Chege requires no introduction to social scientists in Africa, not Kenya by the way, and if you, you doubt me, uh, you may want to Google and find out what I'm saying. There is no social scientist worth his name as an academic who will write on political economy of Africa and fail to read people like Michael Chege. And then we say that that person is reading. Colleagues, join me to welcome Professor Michael Chege to give us his view on this particular discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Karuchi Kanyinga. Uh, that's a very complimentary speech, introduction. And I must always express my gratitude to you. Uh, I've been associated with this university, ladies and gentlemen, for a period exceeding 40 years. I studied here, I've taught here, I love this institution. I, I never leave, I always come back. And as Karuti said, uh, he and Professor Winnie Mitula were once my students, they are not my colleagues, and actually, I'm learning from both of them. And I'm happy that they invited me to come here and comment on this wonderful lecture that we have just had from Professor Jitson. Professor Jitson, we thank you 
for a wonderful lecture that touches on some of the most important issues that affect this country, our country and our continent. And I want, in the rest of my comments, which will not take very long, simply to state the following, that we are largely in agreement with the findings that you present today. We wish that the world becomes greener, it pollutes less, there's more employment, there is less inequality, and less despoliation of our natural resources. And that we use science and technology as a tool to reach there. These are goals we commonly share. And I'm happy that you're bringing in the United Nations system and UNESCO in as leading institutional partners to African governments, to African universities, so that we can get to where we want. I would like, in the rest of my comments, simply to add to the comments that you have made by stating the following, that there are specific problems facing Africa in achieving the goals that you have just set, which we need to pay close attention to. Let me begin by saying this. We are moving on to COP26, as Professor Jensen said, in Scotland, in Glasgow, next month. And we are looking for a solution to global climate change, to global warming. Already, we in Africa have suffered some of the severest effects of global warming. You've worked in Southern Africa, Professor Jitsen, you saw what happened in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi uh, just uh, 18 months ago. And what is happening in our country now? We're having drought, we had excess rain earlier in the year that we didn't need. Ladies and gentlemen, we are suffering. Africa, particularly Eastern and South Africa, Southern Africa, will suffer more. And yet, we only contribute 4% to greenhouse emissions worldwide. We are not responsible for this catastrophe which the world is facing. But we in Africa are paying for it. We must bring this forth to agenda in Glasgow and ask ourselves as Africans, before we even go to Glasgow, how we intend to approach it. Then ask the international community how it can be a partner, a genuine partner to a community, to a continent, which is suffering for reasons not of its own. Number two, I agree with Professor Jensen that science and technology has got a major role to play in answering the questions that Africa will face and pose in Glasgow. And our academics should be at the forefront of conducting research in this. I would like to say the following with regard to Glasgow and on, 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 with regard to science and technology, is that African countries realize this and they don't dispute the role that science, technology, STEM ought to play or should be playing in our development pro programs and projects. Here in Kenya, we have the Kenya Vision 2030. If you look at that document, which our Kenya government adopted in 2008 as our vision of development to 2030, and I led the technical team that put it together, you see that science, technology is included as a foundation of all development, cross-cutting, agriculture, industry, services, all of the above. That input, by the way, was drafted by scientists and social scientists from this university and from our universities. It was not the government. And I pay special tribute to them, to our scholars, because of the genius I saw in the way in which they approached this and drafted it and made the government fully convinced that as a partner, universities and scholars in, Af in Kenya know what the problem are, know how to go out to solve them, and I'm sure as we go along, you're going to see evidence of this. It is true, as Professor Jensen is saying, that science and technology ought to be at the front, and this is what Envision 2030 says. And you see that in Africa 2063, 50 years after 
independence, we see uh, problems of solution getting addressed uh, through science and technology. And if you look at the growth literature, economic growth literature, which I deal with often, you see this is in conformity with the frontier of growth theory. Where does growth originate? The 2018 uh, Nobel Prize for Economics went to Michael Roma for his theory of growth, which was basically a contribution of science and technology and of knowledge in growth as the most assured way of closing the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest countries of the world because knowledge, unlike capital or land or other physical resources, natural resources especially, is reproducible. It is non-rival, as they say in economics, that you can consume it. I can use the Pythagoras theorem today to design my house, and you can use it tomorrow, and somebody else can use it the other day. It does not distract from me. So that is a perfect example of the kind of argument that he was forwarding here. So all this endogenous growth theory and the role of science technology is very much part of what we Africans accept. Point number two, again, I said I was going to address myself with how relevant these issues are to Africa and how we must tweak it and change it a little bit to conform to our demands as we move to COP26, is this. Innovation, science, and technology in African development leaves a lot to be desired, even though it is improving. And COVID has set us back big time. We must address it as we move forward, and we must rely on scholarship and in our universities to provide us and our leaders and our governments with an answer, please. The World Economic Forum in Davos, where our leaders and businessmen go every year, uh, produces the Global Competitiveness Index every year. Within it, the Global Innovation Index measures the capacity of countries to innovate in exactly the same manner that we heard from the lecture that was delivered by Professor Jensen. Now, listen to this. Of the 132 countries in the 2021 annual report on Global Innovation Index, of the 132 countries, the highest ranking African country is Mauritius at 52. The next one is South Africa, 63. Tunisia, 71. Kenya is 85, not bad, 88, Cabo Delgado, and 90 is Tanzania. In other words, there's not a single African country in the top 10, 50 percent, 50 nations in innovation in the world. At the top is Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands. Uh, I can see your background in the, country, the, the institutions you worked in. That's them being reflected there. Uh, United States, United States is not at the top. But they, they do a good job for themselves, but they are, they are not Switzerland and they are not uh, the Netherlands or uh, even up uh, emerging countries like uh, uh, Singapore, etc. Malaysia, just for comparison, and 36. But listen to Vietnam, which I've been tracking in comparison with, with us here in East Africa, 44 out of very, very, very low numbers. How do Malaysia and Vietnam get here? And this is a question that we are asking ourselves when drafting the Vision 2030. And you are good enough to mention to us, Professor Jensen, about the Green Revolution, science and technology, innovation in education. That's what the answer is. That is where the answer lies in how China got to be one of the poorest countries in, our, in the world in the 1980s to right now eradicating poverty almost completely. It's the greatest phase of poverty reduction 
the shortest phase of poverty reduction a country in human history has ever done it in. 30 years or so, moving from pre-industrial to post-industrial country with poverty reduction on a mass scale. This is what Vietnam is imitating, and Malaysia and others. So there's a lesson to pick up here. What to do? If you look at the bottom 10 countries on the World Economic Forum Global Innovation Index, they're almost all in Africa. Cameroon, Mali, Togo, Ethiopia, Myanmar, Benin, Niger, Guinea, Yemen, Angola. Countries with a tradition of violence within, an instability within, tend to have a low innovation index. It's understandable. You just mentioned yourself. If there's violence and instability or too much COVID, the kids don't go to school and universities close. So let's look at issues like this in Africa and ask ourselves, what do you do for countries at the bottom? But I'm also interested with countries that are on the threshold of breaking through to Southeast Asian kind of rapid industrialization, and I count our country among them. I feel sad when I see setbacks in Kenya, or South Africa, or Mauritius, or Tunisia, or Cabo Delgado, or Cabo, Cabo Verde, sorry. <laughs> Cabo Delgado, there is one, no. Cabo Verde. The thing is, the formula is not that difficult to understand. And you yourself in your lectures pointed this out. How do we integrate rapid innovation in science and technology with education, with open economy? Because it's what you're seeing in Vietnam now from the command economy to an open economy that is producing for the market that is not just local, but global. Pick up any shirt in New York today, in the stock market, or London, or even Sao Paulo, where you look, is more likely to be made in Vietnam than China, or Bangladesh, a little bit in Indonesia, or Thailand, and so on. And that's because they are drawing in on industries relocating from China onto Vietnam, and, and Korea as well, to Vietnam, which is a low-cost economy compared to them. That is what countries like Kenya, Mauritius is doing it, that's what countries like Kenya, South Africa, uh, Botswana, and others should be doing. And my country, and all of us who love this wonderful country, should be thinking of this. We don't run too poorly. I just wish our leaders would listen more and talk less about politics and more about economic science and technology. In this ranking that I just mentioned, Kenya is among the top 10 in science and technology in the category of low medium income countries, low middle income countries of the world. These people you see in this university, professors and so on, do wonderful work. Professor Hutchinson, you, you know your work very well. You know our faculties of agriculture, our schools of veterinary, science, veterinary medicine, and even social sciences have a reputation to be proud of. Even innovators outside and up country. Now, let me talk about our universities because you mentioned those and say the following. The problem is in the paradigm that we are using. We in Africa, in our universities, got misled by liberalization and new, new liberalism in the 1980s and were convinced by the donors, including some Western thinkers I and my colleagues disagreed with, that you could turn universities into profit-making institutions by mass production of degrees and by charging a market cost of those degrees and paying lecturers a market cost. Even changing titles of professors and administrators into corporate sounding institutions so that the registrar for administration became director of public relations like you are selling Coca-Cola. This is wrong. 
It is the paradigm we used that misled us. Today we have a crisis in this country, and I feel sorry for the vice chancellors, including my own here in this university, because they are trying to reconfigure that model into a proper university that produces knowledge, not for the market. Then that's because the number of students who are now eligible to enter our universities is lower. You can no longer make balance your books by charging a fee. And there's infrastructure, there's salaries and debt that our university face. The IMF is back in town again. There's also the problems in the 1980s, by the way, insisting that the government reduces subsidies going to the universities. The solution will not come from outside. We must rethink it through. But I don't think it is just a question of quality alone. It's a paradigm. Listen, if you've been looking at the newspapers, you must have seen where some Western universities are hiring Kenyan students to write papers for them. Did you see that? Even PhDs for the top universities in the West. How can those students ask Kenyan students to write papers for them? and pass, get, pass their exams and get their PhDs if Kenyan students are inferior? Answer me. The truth is that there is quality here, but there's no order to it. There's no arrangement to it. There is no organizing our students and our teachers in such a way that that quality is harnessed to where it ought to be. I agree there's reduction in mediocrity all over. It's a mix of good and bad. What we need right now in our universities, as far as science and technology innovation is concerned, is to put together a commission of inquiry with the best brains available in Kenya, in Africa, and the rest of the world, and find out what we need to do to reconfigure our universities so that they're universities and not marketplaces. Mahmoud Mamdani, my colleague, my friend, I think will produce the book by that title, Getting Away from the Marketplace in Universities. The last point I wanted to make, uh, Professor Kanyinga, our chair, has to do with the global development agenda, which this lecture also dealt with. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID has changed the paradigm of development in the world completely. I don't think we even know the damage that this pandemic has caused to our institutions and how we are going to reconfigure it. Already you hear notions, especially in the West, that changes in the marketplace and the, way in the workplace is already here with us and we must live with it. So too with water, so too with energy, so too with food. As far as the global development agenda is concerned, that too has to be changed in tandem. The sustainable development goals will change, if only because the setback in countries like ours are so huge. But even in the advanced countries, if you look at the World Economic Forum in Davos and World Development, World Economic Forum, they're saying there's going to be a dip, even in countries like Sweden and Switzerland and so on, in innovation as a result of COVID. If only because people are not moving and they're not working and they can't innovate in the same way that they did in the environment that was there before. So we must work with the rest of the world to reconfigure the development paradigm that in involves the whole world, both at uh, SDG level and even the AU. And there is one partner here that we must mention who is not very common here, and that is the People's Republic of China. China must be brought into the development debate as a bona fide partner. Right now, they are not in it. They are not, they are a largest tra trading partner, but they are not allowing themselves to be brought in the discussion, not only of trade liberalization around the world, but also the issue 
of debt renegotiation. African countries will not go around the issue or resolve the issue of science and technology innovation and reconfiguring our universities with the debt burden they currently share. A lot of it is mainly from China. And China has, it is not saying we have ruled ourselves out. They are sort of in it, but not of it. We as academics, we as people who study these issues must stay front on. You want to be a, an African partner, a bona fide partner, you must be with us in terms of it. There is no way we are going to move forward post-COVID with the slowdown that we have, with the debt we have, that we have, unless it is renegotiated and payments lowered over time. There are very few leaders in the West now following the retirement of Angela Amako who have any interest in this issue that I can see. Sadly, your country, the Netherlands, used to be a great friend of, and sympathetic to the development world. I'm not seeing it. A lot of concerns with immigration and diversity, just like everywhere else in Europe. So we in Africa must reconfigure this and see how to deal with it. And in this, the universities are part and parcel and should be at the driving force. And that's why I'm here today, because anything concerning this university, concerning output of our staff, and my good friends like Karuti and uh, Professor Winnie Mitula, who I congratulate for full professorship among the being Antoine professor this year, as well as Professor Judith Bayamuka, who was previous uh, UNESCO chair in this university and also played a, a major role in putting these kind of lectures together. I think, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It's always a pleasure for me to speak from this forum because I've spoken from it for so long. It's always uh, like coming back home again, Asante Nisana. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Michael Chuege. Um I should have actually mentioned at the outset that um, uh, Professor Michael Chege was the policy advisor of the President Mwai Kibaki's government. He was the policy advisor on national development and international development issues. And it was during his tenure of advice at the Ministry of Planning and National Development that Kenya's national growth stood at 7.1 percent, the highest growth rate that we have ever had. And all that they did was very simple, to tell the government, leave the institutions alone to work on their own, improve on governance, then create wealth and opportunities for employment. It was during that particular time, if I, were, if I recall actually, that uh, we saw the dairy industry getting transformed in a period of one year or less, if I'm not wrong. So what he's talking about Vietnam and poverty changes, lifting people up from poverty within a, a very short period of a generation is something that can be done and is speaking from that global international university practice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to invite uh, Emmanuel Manyasa my own good friend also, a very good friend of this university too. He's the director of USAW Agenda, a non-profit non organization that focuses on issues of education. He owns a PhD in development economics, a very long work with a long period of experience on issues to do with the education. He's a member of um, Elimuyetu Coalition where we met with him a couple of times and he's quite knowledgeable on these issues. He's also in the advisory committee of SDGs um, uh, forum in this country. Welcome, Dr. Terry, and speak to us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Let me first uh, thank Professor Winnie for inviting me to listen to this lecture. I am definitely uh, richer uh, for having been here today. Professor Jason, thank you very much for giving me a sneak uh, peek into what the future can be and what it should actually be. And for my seniors, Professor Kanyinga and Professor Chege, I am glad to have had a chance to listen to you today. We, I am going to speak about three or four issues around the role of science and technology in uh, SDGs. First, because SDGs are a product of scientific thought. Uh, we, we came up with SDGs after looking at all our problems as a world, as a society, and asking ourselves, how can we creatively resolve all these problems without creating more problems for future generations? Because basically that is what Professor Jason has told us. Those who are trying to solve problems in the past created problems that we face today. So the issue of SDGs was to think about how we resolve today's problems without creating problems for future generations. And so it is a scientific process that has brought us here. And SDGs and sustainable development is actually the original goal of education. Uh, the education that we know that starts from the home is to teach us three things. One, to, to survive. When you're born, you're told this is good, this is bad, this is harmful, this is safe. You learn to survive in the world once you're born. And the second thing that you're taught is how to thrive in the world. Uh, you're taught to thrive, to use whatever resources in this world to make you achieve your aspirations and your goals. And then you are taught how to live at peace with others and at peace with the environment. That is basic to education. So one would expect that when you get to university, which is the highest level of education, that the people who go through university are the richest in terms of being endowed with this skill or being able to survive in the world, to be able to thrive in the world, and to be able to live with others at peace and to live with the environment at peace. Question that we have to ask ourselves is, are our universities uh, delivering that? Are they able to make us thrive, survive, and live in this world without destroying our neighbors and destroying the environment that we so much rely on? And the answers we have been given and, and many reasons why that is not the case. And I want to look at a few issues around why those challenges persist, and, and look at those issues in terms of micro and macro issues. At micro level, we have issues within the university as an establishment that are a challenge. 17 years ago, I was employed to teach as a tutorial fellow in the university. And one, I looked at my job description, and it said, you're going to do research, teach, and do community service. Three things. I left the university after 11 years. By the time I left the university, I realized that what I was practically able to do at that moment in time was just teach. And, and, and I think that that is one of the problems facing our universities today. You just teach, teach, and teach. There is very little time, even if you were to apply yourself to find time to do research. Of course, there are reasons for that. There are resources and other issues, but I'm not sure it is entirely resources. I think the issue that Professor Chege has mentioned about the, the paradigm that we have is a problem within the university, and that is at a micro level in the university. At a macro level in, in, in the country, today, the way we, we regard our academia is that we have people who did not qualify to even study in the university, but who are in politics, being paid more than the, our academics. Yeah. So, so that even when you are in the university and you cannot afford to take your children to a school where uh, someone who did not even qualify to study in the university can take their children, then you cannot focus on doing research because research is productive 
but it is a very long-term investment. If you start working on research today, you don't produce a patent tomorrow. It, it, it takes time. And, and, and if you look at uh, Paul Romer's model, it requires a lot of ecosystem for you to be able to produce that patent through research. That ecosystem is lacking, but also it's a long-term investment and the environment is not supportive. Thus, are some challenges affecting our universities internally and the governance, of course, within our universities. So, so that even progression within some of our universities is not pegged on your ability to do good research. It will be pegged on your, there's a concept that I find very nebulous, your ability to support the, the university, which properly defined simply means your single allegiance to the leader in the university. And, and that, that undermines the focus on the research work that needs to be done by our institutions. Which then brings me to another issue that I, I want us to talk about. The community service aspect of universities. If you visit all our universities, you find very high fences and you find strong gates to those universities. And, and I understand the context because there is a, a lot of security concerns that makes these universities do that. But we have allowed those fenders and gates to become symbols of our seclusion from the communities. And, and, and what does that translate into? That translates into undermining the leadership of the academics in the society. Because they say people don't care what you know unless they know that you care. So if people don't think you care about them, they don't care what you know. What that has done, and that is not a Kenyan problem, I think that is a global problem, is that it has left the leadership that seeks to address all our challenges as a society in the hands of the non-scientific minded. And, and I think COVID has shown us that. That, that. That's why we still have, even with a lot of research work and heavy lifting that has been done by scientists to produce vaccines in record time, we still have people telling others, don't, don't try to use them. And, and those people saying, don't try to use them, are the leaders in the world. And that, that undermines our agenda to try and create the society that we are trying to create. So I want to challenge the academics because they say if someone doesn't know and he doesn't know that he doesn't know, you just ignore that person. That you don't need to invest any time in that one. If someone knows but doesn't know that they know, you awaken them. If someone doesn't know, and knows that they, does, they don't know, you educate. The person who knows and knows that they know, and they can make others know that they know, is the leader. So now for me, the challenge is to our academics. We know you know, but you haven't made everyone know that you know. I don't know whether I make sense. We haven't our academics have not been able to make everyone in our society to know that they know, so that they can be the leaders, and they can be able to therefore influence all the programs that are being implemented in terms of addressing our Agenda 2030 and any other concerns that arise in our societies here. And I want to mention something that is live in Kenya today, we are implementing a new curriculum in education, and there is all manner of debate around it. And most of our universities have faculties of education, but they've been quiet. They have done research on this, they have practiced what is being discussed, but they have been quiet. They haven't contributed to the public discourse. In the end, only those who have spoken will have their opinions taken inferior opinions to those that are 
in our universities will carry the day because they are the opinions that have been expressed. Can you rise up and make us know that you know? <laughs> so, so that you can become our leaders and you can start to take us towards making the world greener. The reason I say this is also because if you look at some of the most developed countries where resources are not a major constraint, still movement towards making the world greener is slower. And it's slower because the scientists are not the ones driving the agenda there. Their voices are still marginalized. Why are their voices marginalized? Because the voices that are able to connect with the masses and therefore assume leadership of the masses are not the scientific voices. How do we make the scientific voices connect with the masses and therefore assume leadership of the masses? and be able to move the world towards the green world that we are all seeking. I, I see my chair is standing and I am actually just winding up. So that is my challenge to us. There is a gap between the scientific community which knows a lot and the masses who give leadership to people and because of that the leadership that is even implementing the Agenda 2030 is non-scientific and, and that is our biggest problem and that is what I want to challenge all of us to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, um, I would have given Emmanuel and uh, Professor Michael Chege a, a, a slightly more time um, but Emmanuel started challenging the university and therefore was feeling very uncomfortable. Um, um, <laughs> I was feeling very uncomfortable because the challenge he was throwing to us is the challenge that um, Professor Mullah, who is seated in this room here, throws to everyone almost every other morning, uh, and no one um, um, uh, uh, has ever taken his challenge. He was raising the same question that Emmanuel, you are raising. I saw him raising the same question today in a different forum about why a university is quiet and leaving uh, the politicians to make decisions on the issues that politicians are least equipped or least knowledgeable about uh, to make their comments on. Um, we have already discussed the need to have a discussion on um, um, access, I mean on um, the challenges facing higher education. We discussed with Professor Hubert and we said that IDS and UNESCO will soon, um, without a date, um, be convening an international forum to discuss some of these particular challenges and uh, we welcome you back to come and see whether we shall have uh, lived uh, to that challenge. Professor Mullah, you will be uh, held responsible for not speaking in that conference because we, <laughs> which uh, those issues you, raise, you have been raising for almost one year now, I, I'll put you in the program whether you uh, uh, well, uh, to, to respond to them in a very clear manner. But thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We are now getting into the plenary, but we are also running short of time. Um, I would like to say the following. Uh, those online, please ask your questions, and then we shall have someone read the questions to Professor Hubert. But those who are with us here, uh, if you have got any question, please, uh, we have got a few minutes to spare for question time. We already... Uh, past the time that we are located for the meeting, but we started slightly late um, because we would like to have Professor Hubert um, and, if possible, Professor Michael Chege and Dr. Emmanuel to respond to them. Um, if there is any member of the audience who has got questions to ask, please do. Um, and if we have got any questions uh, that have been asked online, Professor Awini Metula may help us to read them out uh, if they are available. I know uh, Winnie Mit uh, Mitula is very proficient in terms of Facebook and Twitter. She must be following that, and she will tell us whether actually there is something that has been taking place. That one I know for certain, because I was also monitoring uh, from wherever I was. Um, and if there are any questions, please give uh, the mic to someone to ask the question. There's someone at the back there. Thank you very much. Please mention your name and the institution you represent. And I hope you are not attacking the university. <laughs> if you are, I'm going to switch off the mic. No, I'm joking, of course. 
Yeah, welcome, please. We welcome criticism of any, all kinds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mariam Jeru. I am a current fifth year student at the University of Nairobi. I'm doing uh, mechanical engineering and I'm very grateful for this session. It was really eye-opening. So my question is, um, I guess it's to all the discussants. Okay, in Kenya where unemployment is a current issue, we are encouraged uh, to move towards um, starting your own business or and therefore creating more employment. I guess that's, that's the, the vision. Um, so when you come up with a business plan and all that is concentrated upon is the amount of money you make, the profits you make, and we don't pay keen interest to the impact that these businesses may have either to, to the environment or to the people around the society. Um, we see that uh, we, we continue to damage the environment or to have um, detrimental effects to the society. So is, is there a space that we can develop um, in order to do like these circular studies that we, we don't look only at the profits that we make with whatever enterprises that we start, we can look at what, what other effects do these businesses have so that we can see whether actually we're improving lives in the long term or in the short term. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I think uh, we can start off with that and pro as Professor Winnie Mitula begins to read some of the comments and uh, the questions and then we shall wind up after that. I will, we shall ask, ask uh, Professor Hubert to respond to those questions and then wind up after that. There is someone else? Okay, please. Yeah, I am Ondino Kello, a fourth year student uh, pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and philosophy that is majors. So my question is, uh, I think to the other panelists, uh, you talked about the fact that uh, women are still not involved in uh, matters to do STEM. Then uh, Dr. Emmanuel is talking of the fact that uh, there's that uh, gap between the scientific uh, side and the masses. So my question is, uh, do you think it's time that uh, we focus more on an interdisciplinary approach so that now we could, uh, we could rectify that gap? That gap is between the STEM and women and the scientific body and the masses. Thank, thank you very much. Le let's have just only those two questions from the audience here and uh, Professor Hubert, if uh, you are ready to respond to that as we ask the Professor we need to prepare and uh, respond to that. Yeah, maybe uh, to the first question, <coughs> uh, starting own businesses, um, typically uh, starting small but becoming big businesses. Um, what governments do have to, uh, to steer in terms of also unwanted effects of these companies, including environmental uh, impact or other impacts, uh, is of course uh, carrots and sticks. Um, but one may wonder why, <clears throat> why are oil companies some of the biggest uh, enterprises in the world when they are the most polluting? We have the, the big COP, uh, everyone is discussing there about the impact of climate change, uh, and yet we have low tax regimes for, for this sector, for, for these companies. If you, if you would apply a polluter pays principle to an oil company, um, then, then suddenly uh, innovation will start because oil will become too expensive uh, to market. Um, and you will see new solutions rise and, and, and new innovations come to find alternative energy. So, so this is where governments play an important role and think about carrots and sticks that can steer uh, sustainable development much faster than this happening now. Um, of course, in, in many countries you also have uh, the issue of lobbyists, uh, where, where lobbies to politics uh, uh, Make, make, give certain advantages to certain industries, uh, whether they are polluting a lot, whether they are wanted, whether they have damaging effects or not. 
So I, I think that is um, the, the, uh, where we need to look at how, how can, uh, at the political level, we, we have better uh, steering to a sustainable development. It's all the world leaders that signed up to this agenda. So when it comes to agreeing on the big picture, yes, we do. But then uh, they go back to their countries, they've signed in New York, uh, and then the lobbies uh, happen again, and you get very strange decisions. So, <clears throat> uh, and then there is a responsibility also for the electorate, the public. So when you, when you elect your government, think about these things. Uh, the other question uh, uh, was on uh, STEM and the link of STEM uh, and women uh, and, 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 and sustainable development, the big picture. Yeah, I, I think we need to see these linkages. I don't believe in a, in a simplistic approach where we do a little bit more on STEM training for girls and that will solve the inequality, the gender inequality in, in the science and engineering sectors. Um, so what, what we need, we need to go much further back in the educational system, for instance. Science is this, for many learners, uh, if you ask them about science, they say, oh, there's this that terrible topic that nobody understands. And why is that? Because it's, it's gray-haired professors like myself who, who speak an incomprehensible language on science in front of a classroom. So it is the way we teach science. Um, we, we have to revisit this. Why, why can't we think of science in a more in a more hands-on, joyful manner. You know, when I was uh, leading the regional office in Asia and the Pacific, we started a program called Green Schools. And there, children would learn about issues of climate change, biodiversity, pollution, waste recycling, but all via hands-on projects that they do in the schools. So from waste, from paper waste and plastics, they would make the most beautiful products and bring them home. And what's next? The mothers come to the school and say, we want to learn that too. Uh, they did composting, they did uh, projects on irrigation of the school garden and measure plant crop growth. And, and actually they, they found the same results that, that scientists do, that uh, if you irrigate, you have a higher yield. If you then also fertilize, you have a higher yield. And they produce the graphs on that. But via hands-on learning. And, and even the children at that age, they didn't have science topics. It was primary school. So they didn't know they were learning science, but they were joyful learning science. And that's the approach we need to take. And that will create a whole new generation with an interest in science. Um, indeed, uh, uh, some, uh, I think it was you who made a comment on uh, what is the concept of, of a university. Well, let's face it, many universities in Africa are training for unemployment. And, and that's a disaster. What a waste of energy, resource, uh, of, of young people and talent. So we need to see where, where, where do these programs lead to? Are we training for the jobs that we need for the future? This whole green transition will create so many opportunities for work but we need to develop the skills and the knowledge that will then create these spin-off uh, fire startups and companies. And, and there is a whole wide range of new companies that will come up under this green transition and under this green economy. So we have to start, in fact, already uh, training young people for, for jobs that haven't been created yet. We don't know how these jobs look like under the artificial intelligence and the fourth industrial revolution. I remember myself when I was a young student. And in those days, there was massive unemployment for academics close to graduation. Um, and I was lucky. I was, I was hired by the university I was studying, became a researcher. But most of my study mates, they were retrained because that was the hype of computer programming. And this was the very early 80s. And, and that was then 
That was the third industrial revolution in action. So, so universities responded too late. Governments responded too late. They didn't see this coming. And we have wasted six years of training people to MSc degrees and now say retrain because computers is now the thing. So we could be ahead of the game and plan better. So that's where universities and politicians need to work together. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Winnie, uh, if you can read some of the comments and then uh, we take a very short time to reply to them and then we shall have uh, um, uh, 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 Professor Kinot giving a vote of thanks and then we wind up. Please be Thank you patient very with much. us. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll read them. Uh, there is a lot of engagement online, but I'll just briefly pick some, quite uh, a number. But I think the first critical one is to uh, Hubert and uh, somebody really want to know why education is not among the three drivers that you listed. Uh, another one also is to Professor Chege and uh, Wainaina Ituro is asking, you know Wainaina, he's wondering why, what do we do? Right now people are dying, there is starvation. What do we do? Do we wait to keep discussing and t discussing? Uh, how do we approach it? today, the, the issue of the agenda we are dealing with. Then Achieng is asking, uh, no, Wangare, Michael Wangai is asking about, uh, asking Professor Michael Chege to comment on how do we bring order to education? Because he talked about there is no order. We have the intelligence, we have the capacity, but lack of order. So how do we bring order uh, to achieve that? And then last but not least, somebody is asking, how do we ensure that the message we've heard here today reaches our leaders and politicians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winnie. I will ask Michael Chaga to begin uh, uh, first. Uh, Very good friend and colleague, Professor Ituro Wainaina, asking about what we do immediately, uh, given the perils of climate change, is that we must push for the fulfillment of the promises made in Paris in 2015 for compensation for African countries that are providing a contribution to a global CO2 sink by planting trees and taking a green approach to development. Kenya's energy is 70% green as it is now. Any compensation? No, that I know of. Demanded. Uh, Gabon has done it, luckily. Uh, they are very forested country. We must follow that example. The other thing that we must do is that we must recalibrate our budgeting process. At the moment, it's haywire, and that's why we are on an IMF program. Cut expenditures we don't need, collect revenue that has gone missing, and channel it to humanitarian purposes that we need right now to be addressing. So there's an international angle to this as well as a domestic one. Number two about the universities. I did say the situation is disorderly, but I also said that I see stunning and encouraging examples, both at the level of researchers and our university staff and researchers. And I see encouraging science even among our students. I gave that example of students Unfortunately, fraudulently, it was viewed, it was a special program on CBS, 60 Minutes, where Kenyan students are making contribution, selling, selling papers, and this is to students in Western universities who cannot write or do research, and getting them to pass. So there's some quality there. What you need to do, and I want to repeat this, is get an endogenous African solution to the problem. We need a top-notch commission 
on higher education in our country. There are people like Ituro Enena, there are people like, uh, there are wonderful people like Professor Kinyinjui. Professor Kiamba, who was here as a vice chancellor, all these people have looked at this issue. Look at it again and reconfigure our higher education and give it a sound start all over again with a tweak on the emphasis on science and technology as was envisioned in Vision 2030 so that we can produce uh, students who are attuned to the needs of the country. But let me say this, it's not just science and technology, STEM, and produce, we must look at the demand side as well. How countries like Vietnam and China, the South Asian Tigers have managed to make the breakthrough is that they are also doing the global market in production of goods using the global value chains. If you turn to your domestic market alone, you'll get nowhere. Telling Kenyans to, Kenyan students who are coming out of university to establish a kiosk and an SME and giving them a, a, a remission from their uh, uh, loan at, at help, uh, that's not the way. There'll be too many kiosks. And yes, there'll be too much waste paper in your local market, and you won't be able to handle it uh, environmentally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hubert. One minute, if you, if you can. One minute, please. Yeah, the problem is I didn't understand the question you said. Uh, why is this not part of the three? And I guess the three refers to the three big challenges water, energy, food, but what is the one? Oh, education, yes, yes. No, of course, uh, I'm sitting here as a representative of UNESCO, so I will immediately agree, so I could keep it under <laughs> one minute. But education is goal four of the 17 SDGs, and what I would say about that is, without education, nothing goes. None of these goals will drive anywhere. Um, so education is a goal in its own right, but it is an enabler for all the other goals. And as such, when I singled out the three main critical pillars for sustainable development, uh, new water, new energy, new food, this is never going to happen without education. So. I, I can only agree education is at the heart of everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will ask uh, Professor Mary Kenoti, uh, one of our own, to come and uh, give a vote of thanks on behalf of the uh, Vice Chancellor and the entire University of Nairobi community. Welcome, Professor Kenoti. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, my job now is to give uh, a vote of thanks, and I want to first appreciate um, Professor Gizen for choosing the University of Nairobi, uh, Nairobi to deliver the public lecture titled The Role of Higher Education science, technology, and innovation in accelerating SDG implementation. And I would like us to just applaud him for a job well done. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, I just want to echo what he has told us. Let's reimagine the world without imbalance between people and between people and the planet. Thank you for welcoming us to the future. We appreciate. Uh, secondly, I want to, to acknowledge the Vice Chancellor represented here by Professor Hutchinson who was, who was here before um, for actually starting this, uh, this public lecture Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hutchinson, I know she had to leave. She had another, she had another engagement. And I also want to appreciate all the ambassadors here present or joining us uh, online. 
thank you for being the part of being part of this online uh, public lecture. I want to applaud and appreciate the UNESCO uh, delegation here present. Can we appreciate them? Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, I also want to appreciate um, the discussant. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Michael Chege. Thank you. You have really challenged us, and uh, we appreciate. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Manyasa. I hope I have pronounced that. Um, for engaging us. And I actually noted you challenged the university uh, and you told us if people don't know what you know, then they do not, uh, they do not care. So thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. I want to appreciate the deans and the di directors here present. And uh, I also want to appreciate the chairmen of uh, department here uh, present. Thank you for joining this. Um, this public lecture, either present or on online uh, online platform. I also want to, to appreciate all the academic members of staff here and also joining us online, and also all our non-academic staff. In fact, some of the questions that came, they are our staff who are in the office actually joining us uh, online. And I wouldn't forget our students. And I, at this juncture, I want us to appreciate our students joining us here and those who are online. Thank you for being part of this very, very critical discussion, especially that is affecting the young generation which you belong to and our future generation. Let's appreciate our students. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. So I just want now, as I finalize, to appreciate all those who are joining us uh, in, on online platform, they would be, they could be uh, from uh, international, they could be local, we, we appreciate, we appreciate that. And uh, finally, I just want to say thank you to all of us for making this happen. Asanteni, Asanteni Sana, thank you. Uh, be, before before I I, I I I I want to open the foot of that, I want to appreciate um, our moderator. I also want to appreciate uh, Professor Winnie, and I want to appreciate all those uh, who I was not able to to mention because I could not mention all of uh, all of you. Let's appreciate our moderator, Professor Karuti Kanyinga. Well done. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, let me say thank you very much to those people who have been able to join us uh, online and uh, to people who are already here. Uh, mine is to say thank you very much and Kwaherini. For students in development studies, I think you have got a very clear connection between uh, SDGs and the role of universities, and at the same time, you have, you have revisited the question of Vietnam, uh, those who have been uh, concerned about how to uplift people from poverty. Uh, Michael Chege discussed that quite, uh, uh, quite well. You may want to revisit the book on uh, Asian tigers and African lions, uh, 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 which uh, is uh, uh, an, uh, a book that uh, we recommend for reading. Uh, at this point, let me say we have a national on them, and after that, there will be a photo session which will be coordinated by uh, uh, Mr. John O'Reilly. Thank you, and Asanten Sana, everyone. Asanten Sana. <laughs>
very grateful for 